Hello, how are you? So today we are going to look at the concept of Xenia, right? It's this concept of guest host friendship or hospitality. And it really sits as one of the dominant themes in the entire Odyssey. In every interaction, you see uh, there's a household and there's a guest. The guest approaches the household aggress or approaches the home of someone and they have an interaction that starts to uh, indicate uh, what, what kind of person these people are through the way they carry out this thing called Xenia. Um, so let's turn to our PowerPoint presentation. So here I've given you uh, some of the key sections in the text that really focus on Xenia. And let's start Xenia, the guest host friendship. Why is it so important? Because we live in a world, in the ancient world, um, number one, in which people are very isolated from one another. Many of the people in the world of ancient Greece actually live on islands. And an island is not just a Greek geographical structure, but it also indicates the, the closed nature of the society. You think of modern society. Uh, modern society is open, is tolerant, it's diverse, it's cosmopolitan. Uh, New York, New Yorkers, they're used to being exposed to ways of life other than their own. In the ancient world, for all kinds of practical reasons, uh, and also in, including security and just the lack of ability to be exposed to people outside your own way of life, it would have been the unusual person who would have been exposed to other ways of life. Um, societies were closed, and it was unusual to be interacting with people from abroad. And therefore, people from abroad represented a particular th potential, a potential threat to the, to the society, their own way of life. Xenia, as this process of guest hopes friendship, is going to illustrate a lot of different important themes to the text. Uh, but one function it serves, apart from illustrating uh, the rules of civilized society, uh, as well as something as illuminating something about the character of the people involved in terms of how they carry out this thing called Xenia, is simply uh, it is a process, it's a kind of dance or ritual between the characters, between guest and host, to determine whether that person is a potential friend or a potential enemy. Uh, what's going to make them a friend? Uh, it's going to be a being or a human being with a similar way of life, a similar character, a similar set of values. What's going to make them an enemy? A being that is not like a human being, maybe not a human being at all, like Polyphemus, for example, or uh, simply a human being that doesn't carry on the same type of civilized life that, say, uh, the Palace of Odysseus or the Palace of Alcinous uh, carries out. And of course, in this world, uh, the distinction between friend and enemy has, has a very serious consequence. Uh, the friend is a potential ally in life or death issues, and the enemy can potentially bring about your own demise and the demise of your uh, civilization. So if you think, for example, about the suitors, the suitors really represent an existential threat to the household of Odysseus. Interestingly enough, Odysseus in the palace of Alcinous uh, he is treated with the utmost respect. Uh, Alkinos does not know who he is. He, uh, uh, Odysseus makes a point of not telling him. At some point, the uh, uh, queen Arete, the, the queen of the king Alkinos, asks, who are you? And he refuses to tell who he is. And there's an interesting question, why? And in the aft there's a very interesting aftermath. After Odysseus has been sent off on his way by King Alkinos, and his men, uh, the Phaeacians, which is the, the, the people who Alcinous rules over, are punished for, um, for their good treatment of Odysseus, of all things. Um, and this raises an interesting question. What, what kind of person is out at sea and away from their home for an extended period of time? Well, let's talk about it. First, somebody who's a, a kind of an exile from their own homeland. They, for whatever reason, are not in the confines of their household. Uh, uh, people like warriors who go off to fight in far-off lands. People like pirates. Or people who are in some kind of exiled or refugee status because they're being punished 
by the gods, right? And it turns out as, as much as Odysseus is a humble and righteous guest in the uh, palace of Alcinous, he is also uh, a fugitive from, from Poseidon's justice. And who turns out to be the civic deity of the Phaeacians? It's none other than Poseidon. So as we all know, no good deed goes unpunished. And it turns out that the end of Odysseus's stay uh, and, and the island of uh, Phaeac the Phaeacians is met with the wrath of Poseidon. And Poseidon ends up actually punishing the Phaeacians and King Alkinos for their good treatment of the man who is uh, a fugitive from Poseidon's justice. So I'm giving you a variety of sections here uh, that are going to illustrate different facets uh, of uh, Xenia, and we are going. I'm going to read a, a few passages here and there to really hammer it home. Now we're spending a lot of time on Xenia because Xenia is really one of the central themes, and it is a central theme on which there are so many spokes connected with it that really make up, in many ways, the totality of the book. It starts out as something like guest host friendship, just treat treat a stranger well who is who has come from a far off land. Um, it raises the question of customs, ways of life, and various types of conduct. We see different beings behaving differently, gods, humans, and beasts. We see different types of humans from different places behaving differently because of where they come from and their ways of life, there, their customs. We also see people with different char characters, different moral fiber uh, carrying themselves differently. Uh, we need only compare Telemachus and his comportment with Athena in books one and two compared to the way the suitors carry themselves as guests uh, in the house of Odysseus. Manners and morality, right? The, the Xenia raises uh, the way someone carries oneself, and it is a kind of emblem of civilization itself. We'll, we'll talk about this more in another lecture. But the, uh, the Odyssey really is the book. It is a Bible for the Greeks that is a kind of, you might, it's, I call it the Homeric Encyclopedia. It depicts everything in, in the known world, you might say, this kind of kaleidoscopic look of all types of beings exhibiting themselves and behaving in, in all types of ways. And one of the general distinction is between civilization and the lack thereof. And if the goal of classic literature is to please and instruct, it's the goal is to instruct uh, a people morally on who they are and, and how they should carry themselves. So you see manners of comportment that represent both civility and civilization on one hand and manners of comportment that demonstrate the opposite, which is to say, here is a model of how you should act as a Greek and what it means as a Greek. And here is a model uh, of what it means not to be a Greek which further clarifies what being a Greek is. Issues of morality, right and wrong, principle, moral principles, set of rules, folds into the issue of justice. And when we look at Xenia in a later lecture uh, on the island of Polyphemus, we see clearly the way in which uh, Xenia is not simply a kind of code of etiquette, you know, sipping your tea in the proper way and not putting your elbows on the table. But it really is also a code of justice, uh, of fundamental right of wrong in which justice is meted out with either rewards and punishments based on whether you followed the rules. Right. And we also see that it will turn out to be a divine code of justice. Zenny involves exchange. Right. Uh, I give you this. You give me that in a kind of re through reciprocity. And we'll also discuss the types of things exchanged. And there's a, a whole variety of things, in fact, exchanged from uh, friendly gestures to speech to truth to lies to one's ex acknowledging one's own identity, names, uh, and also all variety of goods. And you might even say services, like Odysseus gets a bath and new clothing. Reciprocity, that just means exchange needs to be a two-way street. And the moment that it breaks down from being a two-way street, it's no longer really an exchange and it no longer comports with the kind of principles of fairness and justice involved in Xenia. Uh, if it's reciprocal, if it's a two-way street, then it's also uh, a show of respect of equality for the other person involved. 
The issue of equality is, in fact, incredibly important because if you think of the context of Odysseus coming into the palace of Alkinos, he is a nobody. He has a non-identity. He literally comes on the shores of Scyria, the island, naked, right? He's he's washed up on the sea, right? Um, he's he's almost like a bum, with lacking in any connection to the world, and. The king, who is incredibly powerful, he, he's got the entire resources of his own kingdom at his disposal, meets this nobody, and instead of treating him in line with that apparent status, he gives him the dignity and respect of, in light of the way Odysseus acts as a guest. And despite the disequilibrium or inequality in their status or apparent status at that moment, Alkinos treats him essentially as an equal, and uh, you know one one aspect of uh, Xenia is uh, something like Mikasa Sukasa, my house is your house, make yourself comfortable, we are equals. Uh, I think he even says uh, at one point, a act act like you're the head of this household rather than me. Civilization and barbarity, we've talked about that, and it connects in with the next theme that Xenia is a touchstone. A touchstone reveals the character of a thing or the nature of the thing through a process. And uh, we see the quality of the person. We see the degree in which they are civilized or lacking in civilization. This will be particularly crucial when we look at Polyphemus' island because Poly Polyphemus is not civilized. He does not have society. He actually is kind of n no man. Uh, is an island, but it seems like the the Cyclopes are are they live as islands unto themselves, each giving him own self, his own law, rather than living in a, a communal existence. And if you look at that island, it is a kind of uh, a kind of itinerary of uh, uh, a lacking of the type of civilization. Uh, that is represented by the palace of Alkinos and Odysseus's palaces. Palace. Last, uh, as a touchstone, uh, Xenia it starts to illustrate the cosmic hierarchy. If Xenia, as a touchstone, uh, helps to reveal your true nature or your true being, uh, the various types of interactions Odysseus has with characters starts to reveal where they fit in the cosmic hierarchy, whether it's God, man, or beast or whether we're looking at within the human realm of men of great character, virtue, and dignity, or people lacking it, right? So you would see someone like Alkinos really at the top of the heap, and people like the suitors toward the bottom in light of the way uh, that they carry themselves. Okay. Xenia. Good manners good conduct, behavior with a guest. It's a ritual. It's a habitual behavior of generosity and cur courtesy shown by those who are far, shown to those who are far from home and also reciprocated by the guest. It is a relationship of peace uh, among strangers, which is unusual in this world. To be a stranger is to be a potential threat. Peaceful relation between guest and host in which gifts are exchanged, uh, dependent on re reciprocity. The concept of a gift in Xenia is really important because when we typically think of exchange, we think of this for that, right? Uh, I give you this under the premise, under the uh, explicit or implicit understanding that I'm going to get something in return. A gift, however, functions on a slightly different um, wavelength. A gift is something that you give out of generosity, generosity, precisely without the the clear, overt expectation, you could say contractually, that something that's going to be given back to you. Nonetheless, when one person gives a gift, it's kind of implicitly understood that someone will return the gift at some future time. So Xenia illustrates civilized behavior, and this is important, fully human conduct. The Greeks' understanding of human nature is not simply defined by one's body or one's physiognomy or one's genes or biology. 
To be a human being is not to simply have flesh and blood and to be of the human species. It is to carry yourself and to live in a fully human way. And for our purposes now, that, that simply means living in a fully civilized way. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just look at a little passage in the interaction, pardon me here, between uh, Telemachus, and this is actually a picture of Telemachus and Mentor, the second form that uh, Athena comes to Telemachus in. The first time she comes as Mentes, and Men Mentes, Mentor, actually have to do with the mind. She's wise, she's clever, she's cunning. In fact, she has many attributes that she shares with Odysseus and Telemachus, although Telemachus is immature by comparison and uh, lacking in kind of worldly experience as this young man who's trying to build up the courage uh, to be a f kind of full man in this process of development, maturation. So we can just look very briefly at the kind of... Um, the, the proper comportment uh, of one uh, in this case. And what's interesting is, of course, Telemachus does not realize he's talking to a goddess, which if he had been fully aware, he would have had, you know, tremendous humility. But, but despite that, he still carries himself in a tremendously dignified way with this stranger who, who he's never met before and treats them with the, the, the utmost respect. Okay. So this is on page 87, and after Telemachus and uh, Mentes have met, uh, Telemachus goes in this great lament about his family situation and the suitors over there who are drinking up a storm and causing all kind of ruckus, and he's feeling very threatened by. And then he also talks about the fact that his father isn't at home, and he's not even convinced that he really is the son of his father because, of course, he's never been around. He just sees his mother and these suitors and his existence, so he's not even convinced he's of the noble lineage of Odysseus and therefore a, a bastard child, which would be um, uh, a, a, a step down not only in his status, but also in the possibility of him taking over uh, the, the palace. So he says, O stranger, heedful, heedful Telemachus replied, Indeed I will. You've counseled me with so much kindness now like a father to a son. I won't forget a word, but come, stay longer, keen as you are to sail, so you can bathe and rest and lift your spirits, then go back to your ship delighted with a gift, a prize of honor, something rare and fine, as a keepsake from myself. This kind of gift a host will give a stranger, friend to friend. So you can see here it's it's not exactly nuanced, right? But you get the clear idea here. You can you can see the way in which uh, the teller of this tale, or Homer, is really determined to highlight the significance. So let's focus on just a, a couple things here. Gives him a bath, rest, time to lift spirits, and a gift. Now we talked about a gift being something that you give without the expectation of clear return out of a spirit of liberality or generosity, which is uh, one of the core Greek virtues. Uh, and it's a prize, this is important, a prize of honor. It raises the specter of one of the things human beings want and bring, brings them into harmony, but also conflict, which is honor, recognition, respect. Um, the Greek world, we'll look at this more in the Homeric uh, encyclopedia, but the Greek world is very this-worldly, very imminent. Uh, there's a passage in Book 1 that speaks of the, glo the glory that can be obtained in the mortal world rather than in the hereafter, or uh, rather one's concern or relationship with God or the gods. Uh, the Greeks, in their morality, seem to be permitted to really pursue honors and glory, and that there's something respectable in that uh, kind of concern that clearly in uh, the tradition that comes out of the uh, ancient Hebrews and Jerusalem it is not of the same status, right? So uh, what does the gift confer upon you? Not just a physical object. It confers you status, honors, and recognition because what kind of thing is he going to give him? It's going to give him something rare and fine, or the, the Greek word is noble, as a keepsake. It sounds like almost as a memento of our friendship. So this object is not really functioning as simply a commodity, a physical material good for this, you know, to serve the needs of the body, 
or, or some such. It's really, it's, it serves a psychological function. And he says, this is the kind of gift a host will give a stranger, friend to friend. Now, this is really important because a stranger is not necessarily a friend. And of course, both of them have carried themselves in a way that they indicate, they see as they face one another, kind of psychically, that they, they, ha they have the same values, they have the same moral code of conduct. And therefore, because they share those things morally, they're able to be friends. Aristotle says uh, in the politics, for example, that um, what makes community most of all is community or holding common, being like-minded in terms of one's core moral principles, right? And if you think about that, uh, it's a, it's a, it's kind of on one hand a profound insight and kind of, kind of obvious, but it, it's crucial to to point out in this conduct that that seems to be what is really making them friends. It, it's not that they're just being nice to one another. It's not just that they're being congenial or amiable. Right. Uh, it's that they recognize in that congeniality that they both commonly share core principles with one another. So in those opening four books, really, there's this great juxtaposition between the way Telemachus carries himself as both host and guest. In the first two books, he's host to the suitors and he's also host to Athena. And then in books three and four, he goes on this journey to uh, Pylos and Mycenae. Uh, to see Nestor and Menelaus. Nestor is one of the older great warriors uh, of the uh, Trojan War, of the great Greeks. Um, he was particularly involved in settling as the, as the uh, kind of a wise elder leader. He's particularly involved in settling disputes between the younger and 30-something uh, uh, generals who were involved in prosecuting the war. Um, Menelaus, of course, his wife Helen was the one who was taken by Paris and initiated the whole cause uh, of, of the Trojan War. Um, what's so fascinating in, in those in scenes is that Telemachus is not really sure that he's truly Odysseus's legitimate son. And when they see him, uh, they see his stature, they see his bearing, they see his facial expression. And they uh, they see through that to be beyond, you could say, the cover of the book to the true character of the man. And what they see is a kind of reflection of Odysseus in, in a younger form. He's kind of a chip off the old block or, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And it's in that that they immediately recognize that he really is Odysseus's son and that that is then reflected to Telemachus. Who starts to come to the realization that I don't I, I'm I'm not just living in Odysseus's house I'm really his son and this is one of the big things that gives him confidence because he's starting to become aware of his true identity which has been a question mark for him up to this point and of course he carries himself as we've just said very well if we look at the suitors for example they're eating they're drinking they're being provocative it's very clear that they're not following any of the kind of rules of etiquette that come with with uh, with the tradition uh, or ritual of Xenia, and they're not, they're a little bit older than Telemachus, but not much older. They've kind of found their sea legs as young men, where Ado as a Telemachus is truly trying to find it. So they're really a kind of a direct point of comparison. You see throughout this text characters that really reflect one another or are foils for one another. So the suitors really represent a foil in their conduct to the conduct of Odysseus and Telemachus and people like Alkinos. Um, looking at the palace of Alkinos, for example, you see that, I mean, Alkinos's palace is really what Odysseus's palace would look like if we're Odysseus were home on the throne, uh, ruling and bringing back the order in that palace that is lacking with his because of his absence and the introduction of the suitors. And the suitors have brought a kind of chaos and anarchy, right? And of course, one of the challenges of their uh, whole, uh, you could say even occupation, is that on the one hand, they're carrying themselves very poorly and not comporting themselves as guests should. But on the other hand, they do have a claim, they do have a right 
by the the rules of the situation with Odysseus being gone so long to be there and to be asking for the hand of uh, Penelope. It's just that they're not doing it in the appropriate way. And of course, we've talked about the, the questioning of what, what their motives really are in being there. They don't seem to really genuinely be looking for the hand of uh, Penelope. So here's another great image of the suitors. This is a 19th century pre-Raphaelite painting, and it captures some of the shenanigans going on. And also something about when guests don't behave well, uh, you don't treat them as well, right? If this is a kind of tit-for-tat, uh, quid pro quo exchange, uh, good conduct is rewarded with good conduct, and bad conduct is rewarded with less than perfect conduct. So we know that the suitors, they are deceitful, and we should talk about them for a second in that they are nobility, right? These are bloodline nobility from other high aristocratic families, and, and that is exactly what makes them eligible suitors in this situation. And if you think of the word aristocrat, ar aristo, aristos means the best, the best. And, uh, well, that's not how we typically understand what an aristocrat is. We typically understand aristocrat is so, someone of high birth, Right. So all these men, interestingly enough, are of high birth and are the best on paper, but they are not the best people in the way they actually carry themselves. So there's a distinction between their nominal status in society and who they really are in terms of their internal character. Right. This is going to be an important theme when Odysseus first comes home in an interesting form and he confronts the suitors without them realizing it's actually him. Okay, so they're engaged in deceit, they're drinking, they're they're happy to eat up Odysseus's substance, and um, they're just angling for kind of political reasons to take over uh, the throne of Odysseus. And meanwhile, here we have Penelope uh, uh, weaving and unweaving this garment so as to buy herself time so she doesn't have to make a decision about the... Uh, suitors and you can see her ladies in waiting around her her maids that are an essential part of the the household the servants in this kind of hierarchical social structure that exists there here we have helen recognizing telemachus that's a, that's of course important because in recognizing him she realizes his full identity and that helps him and him recognizing his full identity Okay, so now I want to talk more specifically about what the stranger represents. We've said that the word xenia comes from the Greek word xenos. It's where we get our word xenophobia, fear of foreigners, right? And the concept, of course, you know, uh, much maligned today, but there, there is a basic rationale for this because a foreigner, a stranger, represents a way of life that is foreign to you. Right. Geographical boundaries don't just represent physical divisions of the earth. They represent different ways of life and different sets of laws and which which is which prioritize and give principle and worth to different values. Right. Um, so a Xenos is a stranger, a foreigner. They're an alien. You think of like illegal alien. They're an outsider or an other. We have our codes and they have theirs. And that's the recipe for a potential conflict. Uh, it's a person of another way of life who doesn't necessarily share our customs. Uh, they're an unknown quantity. And it's through Xenia that we may find out who they are. Therefore, it's someone who is a potential enemy, but a possible friend. And we won't know until we find out. Um, foreigners and strangers are therefore met with suspicion. So here we have a depiction of the kind of ultimate situation in which a character arrives as a stranger in the most radical sense and represents a direct threat. Uh, and that's the situation in Book 6 when Odysseus washes up on the shores of Scyria while Nausicaa, who is the daughter of King Alkinos, is out with her kind of uh, ladies-in-waiting as they bathe themselves and wash their clothes.
<clears throat> so here we see the scene of Odysseus. He's a stranger. He's washed up. He's naked. He's exposed. Uh, he, he's lacking in anything that would identify him. Uh, he, he is a nobody. Uh, she is a young virginal maiden. And there is an implied threat here that's really not spelled out in the text at all. But if you just look at the situation of a naked middle-aged man with these girls who are teenagers, uh, all alone, uh, off in the semi-wilderness by, by uh, a, a lake or, or the waterfront, and uh, lacking in any uh, male escort that would protect them, they are completely vulnerable to this man who is... He's a warrior. He's a killer, right? And when we look at uh, Odysseus's journey from Troy, uh, these heroes are also marauders and pirates. They go and conquer lands and take take their wealth and uh, make off with it. Uh, and it's almost what is expected of in this world. Uh, so let's read. So Homer says, but now as she was about to fold her clothes and yoke the mules and turn for home again, now clear-eyed Pallas Athena thought of what came next, to make Odysseus wake and see this young beauty, and she would lead him to the Phaeacian town, the ball, dot, dot, dot. Now notice she's described as the young beauty, and what's ironic here is just like other female characters that Odysseus met, she becomes incredibly infatuated with him. And, you know, you might ask, uh, why uh, is Odysseus not meant to be on Calypso's island or Circe's island, uh, given the, the attraction and given the appeal of a mortal man being with a goddess uh, or a titan? And the answer seems to be that... Um, on one hand, Odysseus desires to be home, that's where he belongs, and his wife is part of that home structure. Um, she may not have some of the superior attributes of a goddess, but that mm -hmm. seems to be kind of who he is destined, who he is fitted to be with, and we'll see that at the end of the, the epic poem, the way in which they seem to be meant for each other, in a kind of cosmic sense or a natural sense. The other thing is that there's a disparity in the types of beings they are, and they just don't seem to be destined to fit together perfectly. So it seems like goddesses really should be with other gods, and men should be with women and not with goddesses. There's a kind of the cosmic order of things, who they're destined to be. And here you have an, an older man who has really gone through the trials and tribulations of life, whether it's... Um, in terms of war and adventure, whether it's in terms of already having a family, whether it's in terms of his own, uh, or you might even say erotic or sentimental education. She is a complete innocent, uh, and therefore it's, they, their natures are incommensurate. They, they really don't belong together, but of course you can see she's at an age where she's yearning for this, and this, there's these interesting sexual undertones to this whole, to this whole scene. She says, the ball, the princess suddenly tossed it to a maid, but it missed the girl. It splashed in a deep swirling pool, and they all shouted out. He sat up with a start, puzzling, his heart pounding, right? He's woken up from being washed ashore, and he's exhausted, and he's filthy. And uh, he says, he says to himself, man of misery. Now notice, he's speaking to himself here. And we're going to see the significance of reason and reflection and deliberation. Um, uh, what, why do I, why does everyone suffer? Why does he not get home? Why does he get home late? Because of their reckless ways, their blind fools, right? So what? How do you solve what's reckless? To give into your impulses, to give into your instincts. Here we're seeing a moment of rational reflection, right? of contemplating the situation and trying to determine a course of action. And this happens throughout the text. And it's really crucial because um, Odysseus is reckless. He's got a problem with his own maturity, even at this stage in his life. But he also is described constantly, even by Zeus, as the wise Odysseus. And he is very cunning and prudent and discriminating in how to handle a situation. And he has just encountered a very dangerous situation in which a naked man of his age with this woman, I mean, potentially could be 
perhaps even just killed for this the appearance of this situation that would call into question her own virginity and things like that uh, as this eligible princess. He says, man of misery, whose land have I lit on now? He's speaking to himself. What are they? Violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers, God-fearing. Now notice this. This is the ultimate, um, the ultimate, some of the ultimate questions asked by Xenia, in effect. Where, where am I? What kind of people are they? Are they civilized or are they lacking in civilization? And notice, civilization implies friendly to strangers and God-fearing and also living under law, not being savage, being peaceful, right, by contrast. So here we see that, of course, they're friendly to strangers and God-fearing. They fear Poseidon. When we look at po the island of Polyphemus, we're going to see that he's violent, savage, and lawless. And one of the questions is going to be, why does he act that way? So Odysseus is trying to understand how to navigate this situation and make a decision that's going to result in the best possible consequence. He says, Homer says, so Odysseus moved out, about to mingle with all those lovely girls, naked now as he was, for the need drove him on, a terrible sight, all crusted, caked with brine, they scattered in panic down the jutting beaches. Only Alcinous's daughter held fast. So she has this type of courage. She stands there in the face of this naked male who's a strong warrior. The other women get the point. They run, right? That would be the sensible thing to do. But I think the point is here, um, of course, Athena has pla plant implanted within Nausicaa the, the courage to stand her ground. But she also has this kind of, you could say, sixth sense about this man, which other people other good people have, that she really has nothing to fear, and of course she's intrigued by him at the same time. Only Alcinous's daughter held fast, for Athena planted courage within her heart, dissolved the trembling in her limbs. Where does courage really come from? Does it come from the gods, or does it come from our own souls? On one hand, you could say that it came from the gods. On another hand, you could say that nature implanted this courage within her, because she's a she she is a, a, a she has a certain nobility to her that the maids don't and she firmly stood her ground and faced odysseus torn now and who's torn odysseus is torn he says and this is what he's thinking in his mind should he fling his arms around her knees the young beauty pled for help the young beauty and plead for help or stand back plead with a winning word Beg her to lead him down to town and lend him clothing. This was the better way, he thought. Plead now with a subtle, winning word and stand back. Don't clasp her knees. The girl might bridle. Yes, that's what the right thing to do. He launched in at once, and endearing, sly and suave. Now notice he launched in at once. When he tells his story, the expression is going to be, he launched into his story. And if we think of the muse, she launches into the story of Odysseus, this metaphor of the ship being launched out. Um, notice he's he's not quite the serpent, right? He's not evil, but he's, he's subtle and he's beguiling. He's endearing, sly, and suave. And of course, he's going to use those sneaky rhetorical techniques of discourse to win over her heart for innocent reasons. He just you know, wants to get clothed and wants to be protected from his circumstance. But he's clearly, he's a hero who's, who's got some tricks up his sleeve, right? Now notice he has a choice. He can run and cling on to her legs, or he can stand back and plead his case from a distance. Now, first of all, it's really important that this clinging on the legs is a gesture of supplication. Uh, that's part of the conduct in the ancient world. Okay, so what is a gesture of supplication? Uh, it's a gesture of kind of desperation, of humility, uh, a, a, a gesture that uh, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. I beseech you humbly, and I, I beg for mercy, or I beg 
uh, for, for whatever it is I need. So here you actually see Odysseus performing this gesture on uh, Queen Arete, who is the wife of Alkinos. And you can now see exactly why, in this situation with no one else around, with this young maiden, he decides not to grab her legs, because it would be a perceived, it could potentially be perceived as a threat, right? And of course, what's so provocative about this scene of him being naked and her being there, standing her ground, is the threat of rape, to be perfectly clear. Uh, and uh, notice another man, you can imagine the suitors, you can imagine them looking around in the situation. I don't see anyone here. Who's to stop me? Uh, here is a man who, despite the fact that there are no external constraints, regulates his behavior and has, you could say, well, it's partly because he has his priorities in place. He wants to get home, um, and he and he's not interested in making any more mistakes that will hold him off from getting home. Any any later than he already is. So in this relationship with the foreigner, Xenia turns out to be a type of foreign policy enacted not on the level of nations in uh, diplomacy with one another, but with individuals coming from far off lands. And it raises the question of who are they? What is their purpose and motive for being there? Are they a threat to our way of life? Do their interests conflict with our own? Uh, are they civilized like us or are they barbarians? And of course, the funny kind of irony of Odysseus's arrival on um, the island of the Phaeacians is that on one hand, he is a hero. He is a man of great virtue, great character. He carries himself with great dignity on the island. And nonetheless, he is a convict on the run from Poseidon. And there is no doubt that he's a conduct and the Phaeacians ultimately get punished by Poseidon for uh, harboring a convict. You might say that there's something like uh, the sanctuary city of today. One of the important things, I'm not going to read all this, but one of the, well, because we're going to touch on this when we look at uh, the island of Polyphemus. But one of the interesting things here is that uh, Xenia is a code, a moral code of conduct, a code of moral principles and rules, and it ultimately is a pr form of justice and even divine justice, uh, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. But one of the necessities of this thing, Xenia, is that we're in a pre-political context. It's a tribal world that does not have a formal organized political structure. Uh, there is no, I mean, you talk about Greek and the Greeks and the Greek history. There is no Greek nation. There are simply Greek city-states who are bound by language, culture, and religion with some important political differences amongst them. And the Greek world does not have a uniform government over it. And not only that, even within these Greek city-states, their, their form of rule and political authority is not as clearly established and developed uh, as it would be by the high classical age, for example, in the 5th century BC. So therefore, we're living in a world that's really the rule of men rather than the rule of laws. And there is no police force as such. There is no government as such. Uh, there, are, there are kings, but even their authority is not absolute and it's questioned all the time. Um, so we're in an interesting circumstance in which we're in a world where there is no third-party justice system. The parties involved, the guest and the host, uh, have to adjudicate their problems themselves. What do we mean by third-party justice? In our system, if we have a problem, you call the police, right? And it's the police who neutrally and disinterestedly um, resolve the conflict between the, the other two parties, therefore third party, involved, right? What do they do? They enforce the, the rules equally between the people. And if you have a problem with someone else, you don't just act out revenge. You go and call the police. In this world, reprisal and revenge are part of the code of justice because there's no one else to met out justice for you. We need only think back to Orestes, who killed Aegisthus as revenge for Aegisthus killing his father Agamemnon in this whole parallel to um uh, Odysseus Telem and Telemachus and um, the suitors. Um, Orestes 
in taking revenge getting vengeance for his father is celebrated as a just man doing a righteous thing by honoring his father's memory right uh, it's hard for us to imagine something like that but what are we what are we lacking here uh, man, every man is his own law. Every person has to take their justice into their own law. So one way they have to take justice into their own hands. What, one way of thinking about this world, if you've watched a lot of Westerns from, say, the 1930s through the 70s, is one thing that constantly defines the image of the West and also the reality of the American West in the 19th century was that its system of law and the enforcement of law was not really firmly established. So there's always the sheriff who's never respected or taken seriously, where the sheriff realizes that there's a lot more bad guys than there are of him and his deputies. And this, he takes off his badge and he puts it in his back pocket and says, you know, there's no sheriff in this town. Um, we're in the kind of wild west here where these heroes are uh, have to take the law into their own hands. And of course, they, they overdo it. If we think about Poseidon, he's excessive in his uh, execution of divine justice against Odysseus. He's excessively zealous because he's got a personal investment in the execution of the law, which is the, kill, the, the murder of his, well, the killing, the murder, depending on how you look at it, of his son. So Max Weber defines the, the state, he, excuse me, Max Weber defines the state as the human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a territory. So the state is that third party that has the monopoly. They have all the legitimate use of physical force on one another. So this is the very thing lacking in this world. It is because the state, there is no state to step in and adjudicate these conflicts. There is no court system to step in and adjudicate these conflicts with a disinterested judge, right? You think the judge in the black robe, that black robe is supposed to signify their lack of identity and their disinterest, their disinterestedness, their dispassionate uh, approach to the people that come before them. Okay, so you can look at this on the PowerPoint, but I have other important points listed here, many of things that I've touched on in the process. This we'll talk about more, but Zeni is a form of exchange. Aristotle says that uh, all relationships consist of some form or another of exchange and if there is no exchange there is no relationship and we see this is really crucial all variety of things exchanged in the odyssey in xenia things both tangible and also intangible so an exchange has to be reciprocal it's part of a kind of uh, quid pro quo, which is, means this for that, or t a tit for tat, in which there's a kind of social contract, a, 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 an implicit understanding of how this exchange is going to work. Here we see some of the important things exchanged, and it's crucial to pay attention to the fact that um, both tangible and intangible things are exchanged. Intangibles like kind gestures, good manners, favors, trust, respect, and then really concrete goods that when a stranger shows up, they often turn out to be in great need of because they're be precisely because they're away from home, food, shelter, protection. And then, of course, gifts. We've talked about the meaning of a gift. We see things when Odysseus gets sent off. First of all, he gets sent off by the Phaeacians in a big ship, and Alkinos provides his men uh, in book uh, thir 13. He gives him riches, golds, bronze pots, and cups. What are these? They're not just gifts, but they're also trophies of recognition, uh, a sign of appreciation, of the status of Odysseus. We also see other things like entertainment. So when we look uh, within uh, Alcinous' palace, we see that the bard comes out to entertain people. And of course, you notice that Odysseus is brought to tears when the bard sings. And uh, th this is a fascinating little bit where Homer hangs his own shingle and ha has a little kind of advertisement for, for bards and poets, um, such that uh, he celebrates 
uh, the art or the artistry of of the poet. And, you know, you might ask, why was Odysseus brought to tears? Well, that's obvious, because the poet speaks to the heart, and the poet speaks in words and, and stories uh, and employs them in a way that can bring people to tears. They have the power to, to move people's souls uh, and to pluck the heartstrings. There's, of course, another reason why Odysseus is crying in those scenes, because the story that is being sung uh, by the bard is actually the story of the Iliad, and Odysseus is thinking back on his own memories of his own life, and uh, in the process of reflecting, he's brought to tears uh, in light of his situation and the fact that all all other men who are, have survived have made it home at this point. <coughs> Of course, perhaps the most significant thing uh, exchanged, I, th I tend to think, uh, in Xenia is actually speech itself. Questions and answers, names and stories. I mean, what is one of the primary things Odysseus provides as a, as a guest in Alkinos' palace? It's a story, right, that begins in Book 9, where he actually tells the story of the Odyssey, which is the actual journey home from Troy. Um... Why are names important? So, well, let me step back. He, he entertains them. He entertains them. Why are names important? Because they're connected with people's identity. And this is what I want to end with here. Because Odysseus, in uh, the Palace of Achinus, Achinus, does not open up about who he is at first. He is very uh, circumspect and guarded about yielding his own identity. And yet, Revealing his identity is central to this process of Xenia because we need to know who this stranger, this foreigner, this alien is and what our relationship is to them. <coughs> and this gets to the question uh, of why Odysseus does not reveal his identity. Well, because maybe he's taken notice that the Phaeacians worship Poseidon as their civic deity and if they were to know that he was Odysseus, and they were to know that Poseidon wasn't happy with him, they might not treat him as so well as a guest. So now I'm just going to read a few passages from page, pages 184 and 185. Uh, Odysseus is now inside the, uh, the palace, and up to this point he's been shrouded in this kind of mist by... Um, Athena, and it seems like in part to conceal his identity, in part to change the perception of those seeing him, what they have of him, and in part to just kind of mesmerize them and make him, as this stranger who's been pulled out of the drink, acceptable to them. Here we've got the scene where Odysseus actually confronts uh, Queen Arete, and it's interesting, the Greek word Arete means excellence, a term that will be really important to us uh, moving forward. Odysseus, in this gesture of supplication again, pleaded with the queen, Queen Arate, daughter of godlike uh, Rexenor, here, after many trials, I come to beg for mercy. Your husbands, yours, and all these feasters here. May the gods endow them with fortune all their lives. May each hand down to his son the riches in this house and the pride of place the realm has granted him. But as for myself, grant me a rapid convoy home to my own native land. How far away I've been from all my loved ones. How long I have suffered. So you see a number of things here. He pleads on the mercy of the court, on the mercy and decency of Rorate to not do something bad to him and also help him to get home. And he plays on their own appreciation and comfort in their own homes with his de uh, to identify with his desire to get them to identify with his desire uh, to get home uh, as he's been away for so long. And of course, the theme of suffering comes up again. Of course, he's pleading for their pity and compassion. And of course, we as the audience 
uh, are supposed to uh, feel a sense of pity and compassion for Odysseus, which is a fairly odd phenomenon when you think about it, because Odysseus is a hero. He is near godlike. Um, he has exceptional capacities that outstrip any ordinary human being. He has all kinds of virtues that we don't have. Most of the time we're looking up at him, uh, or rather, in the basic understanding of who he is, we should be looking up at him. But often we find ourselves looking down on him in compassion because he's in a position beneath us. Um, <clears throat> so what's the response of Alkinos's palace? Of course, they respond well. Uh, Alkinos says to the herald, Come, Pontinus, mix the wine in the bowl, pour rounds to all our banqueters in the house, so we can pour out our cups to Zeus, who loves the lightning, champion of suppliants. Suppliants' rites are sacred. So Alkinos has said that uh, Zeus is the champion of suppliants, basically people coming begging for something, something, and it will turn out that Zeus is the champion and protector of strangers in this situation. He says suppliants' rites are sacred. Why? Because the rites of the suppliant are protected by Zeus and his divine justice. And this is very interesting. If we turn forward to Book 9, uh, on page 219, we see Odysseus invoking the rights of the suppliant uh, under the watchful eye of Zeus. Uh, so, of course, this is a moment in which he confronts for the first time, face to face, or one eye to two eyes, Polyphemus, uh, and he is begging for justice. And uh, perhaps he's begging for it because he's not going to get it to begin with. And he knows that. But he says this to Polyphemus the first time he speaks. He says, we are at your knees in hopes of a warm welcome at your knees in this gesture of supplication. Even a guest gift, the sort that hosts give strangers. That's the custom. He says, respect the gods, my friend. We are suppliants at your mercy. Now, the fact that he has to ask the host to respect the gods in this ritual of Xenia is an indication that they may not get that respect. He says, Zeus of the strangers guards all guests and suppliants. Sacred. Strangers are sacred, and Zeus will avenge their rights. So here we get a clear indication of the way Zeus is the protector of strangers. He's even called here Zeus of the strangers. That's his full uh, name, and that Zeus mets out justice for those who do not follow uh, the, the code of Xenia. So to return to page 185, we see Alkinos' response to the seriousness of the rights of suppliants. He says, Hear me, lords and captains of Phaeacia. Hear what the heart inside me has to say. Now our feast is finished. Home you go to sleep, but at dawn we call the elders into full assembly, host our guest in the palace, sacrifice to the gods, and then we turn our minds to his passage home, so under our convoy our, our new friend can travel back to his homeland. No toil. No troubles, soon rejoicing, even if his home's a world away, which it feels like. And on the way, no pain or hardship suffered, not till he sets foot on his native soil again. So they're not going to be responsible for his suffering, although they seem to think his suffering may not be done. There in the future, he must suffer all the fate and all the overbearing a spinner spun out on his lifeline the very day his mother gave him birth. The concept of fate here. But if he's one of the deathless powers of the blue, the gods are working now in strange new ways. Always up to now, they came to us face to face. Whenever we'd give them grand, glorious sacrifices, they always sat beside us here and shared our feast. Even when some lonely traveler meets them on the roads, they never disguise themselves. We are too close kin for that. 
close as the wild giants are, the cyclope is t the cyclops too. So we see the, here the way in which Alkinos is unquestionably a just, a noble host. And now we turn at the end here to Odysseus's identity, right? And how does he respond to this great oration from Alkinos about what he's going to be provided on page 186? He says, I am nothing like the immortal gods who rule the skies. So you notice in the previous speech, there's this intimation that he is one of the deathless powers. Who, who are the deathless powers? Those are the gods. You never know when a stranger could show up at your door and they could actually be a god in disguise. We've already seen that. But of course, he's he's godlike, but he's not a god. He says, I am just a mortal man. Whom, whom do you know more saddled down with sorrow? They are the ones I'd equally, ones I'd equal, grief for grief. And I could tell a tale of still more hardships, all I've suffered, thanks to the God's will. But despite my misery, let me finish dinner. The belly's a shameless dog, there's nothing worse. Always insisting, pressing, it never lets us forget. Destroyed as I am, my heart racked with sadness, sick with ang anguish. Still it keeps demanding, eat, drink. It blots out the memory of my pain, commanding, fill me up so there's a lot here but i mean this is an image of odysseus the man of many sorrows the man of much suffering these epithets that have been used to describe him and here we see an image of on the left of the bard playing their lyre and singing the tale of uh, the iliad the trojan war and alkinos and his wife and alkinos turns to notice that odysseus is in tears of course we've talked about some of the motive there. So not only is Odysseus framing himself as this man worthy of great pity, and he acknowledges that he's being he's suffering at the will, hand of the will of the gods, um, but he's also concealing his identity. He's just an anonymous suffering man. And uh, on page 187, Queen Arete steps in and finally asks the question. And notice they don't do this at the beginning. They do it after they've already guaranteed that he's going to be given all the things he needs. So that's a sign of trust and a trusting nature. She says, stranger, and that word is portentous here. I'll be the first to ask, first to question you myself. Who are you? Where do you come from? Who gave you the clothes you're wearing now? Didn't you say you reached us on the roving sea? Right? So these questions are questions of suspicion and questions of concern, of skepticism about who this man is. And she's wondering, of course, he got the clothes on the way back from uh, meeting Nausicaa, the daughter. And of course, he doesn't want to have to tell about how they initially met because of the compromising circumstances of it. He responds, what hard labor, queen, the man of craft replied to tell you the story of my trouble start to finish. What labor? He doesn't want to have to open his mouth about it. The man of craft, right? And here that seems to apply, imply a certain amount of cunning, reserve, discretion. He wants to avoid being fully forthright. And what's interesting here is, uh, as a guest, he's been treated with great trust, and he's responding with less than uh, openness about himself which is only going to lend to uh, suspicion. So to conclude now, I just want to look very briefly at page 212, right? This is the moment, this is book uh, 9, beginning of book 9, where Odysseus actually finally reveals his identity. What is one part of Xenia? It is the process by which someone's identity is revealed. Could be their inner character, could be their name, could be their status, any, many facets of identity. We'll look at that going forward. Um, but there's, he's been very reserved because he knows that Poseidon is their civic deity, and he's concerned about the threat that poses. He's already acknowledged that the gods, uh, he's a refugee, uh, he's a convict on the run from the gods, and he doesn't want to have to acknowledge that aspect of his. So he has to be deceitful here. This is very interesting in his own self-interest. Uh, but he's gone through, uh, he's cried. He ends up crying twice. 
Uh, he's gone through the uh, day of contests with the younger uh, nobles of the palace that are very much like the suitors, except uh, we're in Okinus's palace. And he started to reveal himself. He throws the discus further than everyone else, and everyone's stunned by what he's done because he's they they see him. Oh, he's an old man. Why don't you you get off your rump and see if you can mess with us young whippersnappers? And he and he and he proves he he, he puts the money where their mouth is, and and he shows them up. So <clears throat> then the story in the end of book eight, the story of the Trojan horse is told. And this is, in fact, a story that only appears in the Odyssey that's not actually in the Iliad. And this was something of Odysseus's design. It illustrates his cunning, his wisdom, his know-how, his craft, uh, his, his ability. And, of course, it's a deceptive way of getting into the city, of building this winny, 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 wooden horse that appears as a gift, right? It appears as a gift, and it turns out not to be a gift. It turns out to be... <clears throat> the um, the ruse by which they're uh, able to get into the city of Troy and, and conquer it. And uh, Odysseus doesn't seem to be able to hold back telling his name. And one question is, why? And it seems to have to do with his desire for recognition. He wants to be seen and appreciated for who he really is. And that can't happen without saying his name and for everyone to realize all these exploits that we've heard about Odysseus are actually about the man who is before us right now. He wants recognition. It's not clear that he's doing it so much out of honesty. It seems to be he's doing it. He can't almost he can't help himself. And we'll see this again in Book Nine with Polyphemus. He says, Now let me begin by telling you my name, so you may know it well, and I in times to come, if I escape the fatal day, will be your host, your sworn friend, though my home is far from here. I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known to the world for every kind of craft. My fame has reached the skies. He doesn't mind tooting his own horn or singing his own praises. He's a man of every kind of craft, of skill and ingenuity, and his fame has reached the skies. His fame has, of course, reached the island of the Phaeacians. It's reached all the way to Mount Olympus and Zeus. Sunny Ithaca is my home. Who am I? Who I am is where I come from, whom I'm born from, how famous I am, right? Atop her stands our sea mark, Mount Neriton's leafy ridges shimmering in the wind. Around her a ring of circles, si islands, circle side by side. Delikian, Same, and wooded, wooded Xanathus, too. But mine lies low and away the farthest out to sea, rearing into the western dusk, while the others face east and the breaking day. Mine is a rugged land, but good for raising sons, and I myself, I know no sweeter sight on earth than a man's own native country. Right, so you can see in, in this passage the connection between his identity and his home. In a sense, he's not Odysseus until he makes his way back home and he is in the place that connects him to the core aspects of his identity. And if you think about it, this, this passage sums up the entire motive, the aim, the goal, the talos of the journey. His journey here is not to perform great heroic deeds. It's not about getting any more fame. It's about something very self-interested and simple that everybody can understand, returning home to the place where he belongs, his household, his domestic life, his wife, his son, and assuming the position that he yearns for and that he has lost. Okay, so let's just, let's just sum up very briefly. We can start to see the way in which Xenia is this one concept that starts to root itself down in almost every aspect of uh, this story. And, I mean, if nothing else, you notice, now that you see clearly what it is, the way in which it uh, this ritual is reproduced and replicated throughout the entire text, right? And uh, we might just leave it with this. I mean, Xenia is a process of just kind of civilized conduct that mostly involves uh, conversation and various types of activities. It, it's not it's not about action 
It's not it's not about high action in terms of going and fighting a war. You would think like an action film. I mean, if you think of the Odyssey as an as a kind of action thriller, which it most certainly is, it's actually surprising the extent to which the text is actually dominated by discourse between people and that Odysseus the hero spends much of his time not actually performing great heroic deeds but in uh, conversation with people right uh, and it illustrates that Odysseus is a is a hero uh, and the hero is not simply defined by those great heroic deeds on the battlefield but acts of speech and it's going to suggest something new about the hero that the hero is uh, the virtues of the hero, the excellences of the hero, uh, start to have more to do with the mind than with the body. And we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.